Just look at where real estate has gone. Prices are now literally unaffordable to the masses. When the general public is allowed to take on a mortgage so massive they can't actually pay it back, what do you think will happen? In the US in 2007, we found out what happens when you overextend yourself. Interest rates today are rising, and that's putting unbelievable pressure on home buyers who hold massive levels of debt. This is going to get ugly. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we're going to have our focus on the Canadian housing bubble. I also want to talk about the US housing market. I want to look at other places around the world. Stay tuned for a jam-packed episode. Let's begin with this. Canadian home sales down 16% year over year in May. This was going from the most hot market you could ever think about leading into April of 2017. It peaked out at that point where you had people standing outside of homes in bidding wars. They would go in one at a time, put their bid down, and then come out and see what the next person bid and so on. They wouldn't take the normal way where you would call your real estate agent, your realtor, and say, I want to place a bid on this home, and then you try to negotiate a price. None of that was happening. They were putting prices on homes that had no no connection with what that home was actually worth. It was just literally any price. They would put it up there. People would be in bidding wars that you would not believe. Everything was selling for 30 40% over the asking price every single time around. People were going crazy with the amount of debt that they were putting themselves into. Literally million dollar mortgages for the average person who can never pay that back ever. Today things have changed. Canada's national housing market continued its sluggish performance in the month of May despite warmer weather. Usually a busy spring selling season, buying activity has been awfully quiet. New mortgage regulations in full swing. It's making a big difference now. New mortgage originations among millennials in Canada fell by 19.5% between the last quarter of 2017 up until the first quarter of 2018. Okay, so big numbers, big changes are happening. And as mortgage rates continue to rise, obviously that's going to put a bigger burden. And before I forget, I wanted to mention the fact that as these, let's say the big lenders, the big banks have been unwilling to lend to certain people that just doesn't push people out of the market. They go to alternative mortgage lenders. They have worse rates. They have worse terms, but people want the home. So they buy them and this only puts additional pressure on them in the medium and longer term. That has also been showing up in the sales data. National home sales declined by 16% year over year for the month of May. This marked the worst year over year decline since May of 2008 when home sales dipped 17%. Now, remember that Canada did not experience the downturn like the US did. We didn't have the subprime crisis. There was a slowdown, there was a little bit of a dip in the prices, but nothing compared to what was experienced in the US. It just got it, you know, got back up and continued on again. And this really is a representative of what we see today with the bubble that it seems to be not stopping here at a time when people should be paying down that debt, not taking on more debt. There are some areas of Toronto definitely that have continued to see home prices rise and sales are still going on, but there's fewer and fewer areas. The less affluent areas definitely are seeing prices decline. They're seeing uh, much more inventory here. So I'll show you that more in a moment, but year over year change in home sales in May, you could see this graph right here depicting how low this has gone and no different than what we saw during uh, the 2008 issues that were experienced, despite the fact that things did turn around very quickly uh, compared to the US. Still, it shows us where we could be heading. If it's you know stagnant for a period of time and interest rates are rising, that's also going to put a lot of pressure on people. Year-over-year year change in inventory. Now, while the inventory is still historically quite small here, you can see the trend. The trend is working its way up. So that is very important to note. Back in 2016 into 2017, we saw uh, a lot of selling occurring. You couldn't keep anything on the market. It would stay there for hours. The rental market was so hot that you couldn't even, imagine this, you could not even see it before you bought it. You would have to know the type of unit it is. You would have to get a good sense of 
uh, how the unit was from the pictures and rent it before even seeing it or else you would literally be priced out somebody would offer uh, that price before you can get in there that's how crazy things had become the bar is now higher for home buyers to qualify for mortgages in Canada after Central Bank raised a key metric used in such tests that determine borrowers' eligibility. Now, by the way, I just wanted to mention that this and a couple articles here are a couple weeks old, a few weeks old, and so I just wanted to bring them to you because I never did get a chance. I'm collecting all the data. This is what I do, by the way. If it's a particular issue, it may take me a few weeks to put together a video. I don't necessarily do them uh, all in that one day. I, I like to collect data from different sources, put it together. All right. The Bank of Canada raised the conventional five-year mortgage rate from 5.14% to 5.34% after all the big six banks raised their posted five-year mortgage rates in recent weeks. The central bank qualifying rate is separate from the actual mortgage rates offered by banks, but is used to assess how home buyers are seeking loans. It goes on to talk about the details of it, but essentially mortgage rates are climbing and the average person can't take it in fact just the 200 dollars increase is going to burden them significantly that goes for both the us and canada and they will have a problem with this now this is obviously for those who know about ontario there's a new premier and the premier think of the premier like a governor uh in the us doug ford so he's in now but at this time, just before that, he had the, this proposal to allow more building. And basically what they're saying is these areas are too populated. We have too many homes in these areas and the prices are very high. Let's develop areas further out. There are certain areas that are protected. You can't develop here for obvious reasons. But what they want to do is make those zonings, uh, change them to be able to have residential homes up in there. So we'll see if they actually would be able to do this in the future. It looks like it's not happening at this time. But in the event that does, I think that that could uh, allow for more availability for homes for individuals who can't afford in the cities or even in the suburbs now because the price has become so high now i should mention the fact that we've seen some prices definitely come down significantly from their peak but the peak was ridiculous to begin with it's like if you look at san francisco right now average price selling for 1.6 million dollars i mean just the amount of debt people are taking on that's what concerns me not necessarily the price okay just remember that Spring has finally sprung, but Toronto's home sales remain gloomy as tougher mortgage qualifications and rising interest rates continue to push buyers out of the market. Real Realtors in Canada's biggest city had one of their worst months in the past 15 years in April, with sales down by almost one-third from a year earlier, okay? That's important to note what has been going on, the trends that have been continuing here talking about the details i'll move on just wanted to show you that it is looking a little ugly right now here for a lot of people who don't realize what's happening in the market they simply believe real estate always 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 goes up and that's just not the case a key rating agency has downgraded its outlook on ontario's finances to negative from stable and that is uh, just from a few weeks ago, essentially, but it's not that significant, but it does play a factor into uh, when, when you have uh, different debt instruments. They like to see it as being very, very strong. When you have these ratings that go downward, you tend to find that the yields are affected by it. So that, that's all I'll say about this. There's a housing mania in this country that has to be stopped before it collapses the entire market. Recent example, a report by CIBC World Markets and Urban Urbanation found that investors accounted for at least 48% of all buyers who took possession of newly built condos in the greater Toronto area area last year at least 44 percent of those investors with the mortgage are currently in negative cash flow which means that rents charged to tenants don't cover their mortgage payments and condo maintenance fees what they're believing is that eventually in the near term midterm that they will be able to have the profit that they've been making off of these condos and have that pay for this uh, loss that they're taking in the meantime that's not good you only take a deal that's positive cash flow 
You don't ever want to get into a real estate deal that doesn't pay you right away. What's the point? Why hold on to real estate as a so-called investment if you have to pay into it? That doesn't make any sense. There are times in which you could buy real estate that would be, let's say, uh, cheaper to you at, at you know in, in a given moment. But if that time isn't now, you don't buy it. There are always different assets around which you can buy. But also, a lot of people tend to buy in their own area. They buy the house down the street or maybe in a different neighborhood. But you can think about it. You can buy houses practically anywhere. It doesn't have to be right where you are. And if it's too far, you can always have uh, you know, a company to take care of it. You know, and they would take, I would say, industry standard is about 10% of the um, the rents. So don't think that you need to buy a home in the area that you live in. It's generally just for many people who are considered, you know, more unsophisticated in their concern. They want to take care of it themselves and I understand why, but you don't necessarily have to think like that. Now I just wanted to show you a couple things and then I want to get to the US market as well. Canada retail sales month over month. You can see that this has declined, but again, we saw this a few months ago where the trend is, I don't know, but I do feel a little bit of strain happening right now on people as they're pushed into the maximum debt, their credit is maxed out, they've been using their homes as an ATM, and if the home price doesn't continue to appreciate, then the amount of equity that they have there isn't uh, increasing. I think it's pretty uh, interesting to see what people do in Canada here with their homes, quite unfortunate in fact, because they're going to be burned by it. U.S. median home sales price on average has continued to escalate. This year has gone beyond what we saw in 2007, 2008, and then of course we saw that dip downward, but it was uh, short-lived because now we're far beyond that. Mortgage rates are increasing, and I do believe that is also a burden for Americans. Now, Adam Data, you may know this company already I've shown you before the Q2 2018 US home affordability heat map what you can do is I'll have the link in the description under sources if you're interested you can put your mouse over these different areas if I can get it to work and you can actually see for yourself some different prices you know if I look at San Francisco it's showing me here different areas if I can find some of these areas maybe that you are particularly interested Santa Clara for example if I could get that there annualized weekly wages showing us 126,000 percentage of annualized wages to buy 72 percent and so on it just tells you all the details I wanted to bring that to you to show that to all those out there who are interested you want to know which areas are more affordable than others this will tell you that right now and it's updated as of the second quarter okay now two things about canada that i think are very interesting one is from barely surviving to thriving ontario basic income recipients report less stress and better health so there's uh, this whole universal basic income plan that they have in Ontario. They've decided to do this for people who went from the lowest point of the low, they give them a paycheck and they see how they're doing after. What do you think that's going to do? Of course, that's going to benefit them. Of course, you're getting money. You're getting free money. Everybody would love free money. Unfortunately, it's not free. Free money doesn't exist. Free money comes from you and I, the taxpayer, who have to pay all of these different programs that they set up. It's not a good idea. It never was. Universal basic income is simply a way to take from everybody to make sure that there is no middle class. Okay, look at this here. I trusted him with my money. Woman says broker churns her account, rakes in over $250,000. So they took this lady who didn't know any better and were creating all of these transactions. For those who don't know how this works, essentially, there are um, transaction fees that take place within a financial account. So if I have a, you know, my uh, investments with a particular company, whatever bank, XYZ, let's call it, this bank can just take it and hold it there, and they, the advisor would make trailer fees. So if that person holds your money in these accounts based on those particular funds, they may get these different trailer fees, whatever that is, right? Let's say they're going to make a few thousand, 10,000, 20,000, depending how big their book is, they'll make those trailer fees every month, okay? So regardless, 
they're going to make that. But if they start to do trades within your account, okay, they move it from, uh, you know, a tech fund, they move it into, uh, you know, a staples, household staples fund that's going to be, uh, you know, earning a different trailers based on, you know, these back and forth, every trade they make, they're going to be making a profit. And this individual here was doing that to this lady earns $250,000 by doing it. Okay? That's the way that they work. These people in the financial industry, guess what? They don't have your best interest in mind. Does that mean that necessarily you shouldn't, you know, there's not good people over there? Of course, there are lots of good people available all around. But whose interests do they have in mind? Yours or theirs? Their mortgage or yours? Their finances or yours? If you found this video informative, please give me a thumbs up when you give me a thumbs up. It helps to support this channel. So I want to see these thumbs up. Please, everybody, do me a favor and hit that little button. And if you want the financial education that was not taught to you in school, these two books have it all. I talk about real estate in both of them. I talk about making money. I talk about saving money. I talk about tax incentives and so much more. You could flip through these books at Amazon. Just click the link in the description. It's going to bring you over there. You can flip through the pages of the books for yourself. And if you're more interested in the audiobook version where I've been finding a lot of people are more interested in that now, then you can get that at themoneygps.com.